Welcome to the Video Workbench Classic Series Instructional Video, How to Build World War II Aircraft. See how to paint and weather a Mosquito's Merlin engine. Wire in detail radial engines on the A6 M50. Photo etched and resin detail on an ME109G cockpit. Different aluminum panels, interior detail, and battle damage on the B-17. And as a special bonus, how to build your own vacuum form machine, how to use it, and how to make replacement panels and hatches. Even though originally produced in 1992, the techniques used in this video still cover everything you need to get going with your model kit. The examples shown here really haven't changed too much. There is no definitive way of building a model kit. Everyone has their own way of doing things, and with time, so will you. This video teaches dozens of useful tips, no matter what your skill level, including what I consider the three important T's of model kit building, tips, tools, and techniques. I would like to talk a little bit about the instructor in this video, Chuck Davenport. He's a former United States Air Force navigator who made extensive use of his models and photography during his military career. He's used his model kit photos for intelligence briefings and often fooled experienced aviation officers. His model kit photographs have appeared in trade magazines such as the Journal of the International Plastic Modeler Society and Fine Scale Modeler, just to name a few. I hope by watching this video that you walk away with a better knowledge of how to safely and correctly assemble a plastic model kit, along with having found or coming back into a hobby that is very fun and rewarding. Thank you and enjoy. On December 7, 1941, the United States entered the war that had already engulfed the remainder of the world. For America, the war years were epitomized by such heroes as Jimmy Doolittle, Robert L. Scott, and others. Our fascination with their exploits, the mystique of aerial combat, and the explosive growth of aviation technology has kept alive our interest in that period of history. Today, we are far removed from the throaty sounds of Merlin and Pratt and & Whitney engines. The smell of 100 octane aviation fuel is gone from the flight line. But the danger and excitement of an era gone by lives on in the models of these World War II aircraft. aircraft. I'm your host Chuck Davenport, Director of Publications for the International Plastic Modeler Society. For the next hour, I'll be your guide on a journey that is intended to introduce you to the world of modeling World War II aircraft. For much of that time, we will be discussing basic construction techniques, advanced techniques, and techniques for those who are considering entering competition. We'll use as our subjects examples of some of the most popular aircraft of the war years, the U.S. Air Force B-17, produced by Monogram in one-quarter scale, the Royal Air Force Mosquito, produced by Ravel in one-thirty-second scale, the Japanese Zero, produced by Hasegawa in one-thirty-second scale, and finally, the Messerschmitt BF-109 G-10, produced by Ravel in one-forty-eighth scale. To begin your journey, It'll be useful to talk a few minutes about references and resources if you wish to expand your modeling skills beyond the manufacturer's suggested finishing guide. Now, collecting books and magazines can get expensive, so allow me to suggest that you join a modeling club to share resources. You can contact your local IPMS club through your neighborhood hobby shop. Remember, hobby shops are your best source for kits, books, and detail accessories, like the ones you'll see in this video. So, always shop your local hobby store first.
The next step is to thoroughly wash all the plastic parts in warm, soapy water to remove mold release agent, which prevents paint from adhering properly to the plastic. If, however, you do have a warped part, this can be removed by placing the part in a stream of hot water, twisting against the warp, and checking for accuracy. Repeat the process as necessary, but do not heat the plastic too much or you could cause even more damage. If your intention is to build a highly accurate replica for competition, then you're going to need to pay very close attention to the details. Such tasks as drilling out gun barrels, removing flash, and modifying parts are best accomplished during the initial stages of construction. Now you need to keep in mind that aircraft aluminum is thin but the molding process for plastic models has its limitations. In this case, I'm using a pen vise and a number 76 drill to open the ends of gun barrels. Likewise, an X-Acto blade is perfect for scraping mold lines away from plastic parts. Here, I'm using a Dremel tool and a grinder to remove plastic and thin the cowling fins. Important safety tip here is to always wear eye protection when using a high-speed rotary tool such as this. The plastic can really fly sometimes. Now I've managed to get ahead of myself here. So let's back up and cover the basic assembly sequence of any given model. My personal preference? I like to build the models just like the aircraft were actually manufactured, in sub-assemblies. Fortunately, most modern instruction sheets are geared to take you along in this somewhat logical fashion. I'll underscore the word attempt, because often things don't quite work out as we expect them to. So that's why any modeler worth his or her salt will dry fit major components to check the fit prior to gluing. An area of frequent problems is the wing or trailing edge to fuselage fit. To fix this problem, you either trim the plastic till both sides fit flush, or you shim with plastic. In either case, if you have accurate drawings, make a template to ensure the dihedral is correct. In a contest, one of the first things the judges will check is the alignment of the flying surfaces and landing gear. If these things aren't dead on, you can count yourself out of the competition. Let's begin our sub-assembly work by doing the easy stuff first. As with any other part in the model, you want to remove it very carefully from the tree using a sharp knife, and then clean off the flash. My personal preference for gluing models to plastic models together is methyl ethyl ketone, MEK. It's fast acting, dries quickly, it's a chemical adhesive, the downside is that it's highly volatile and requires a tremendous amount of ventilation. So if you have children, you may consider not buying methyl ethyl ketone. In the larger scales, you'll find that the wheel tread patterns are fairly well represented. However, when you get to the smaller scales, don't be surprised if you wind up with nothing but a faceless little blob like this. So what we're going to do is spend a little bit of time just to show you how to dress these little blobs up. There are two basic types of tread that you can add to existing tires. One is straight and the other is cross-hatched. In order to do the straight type tread, you need a Dremel tool. With your Dremel tool comes an arbor. When you take the arbor, mount your tire on your arbor and screw it in there tightly. You want to make sure that as you rotate the tire that you don't see any apparent wobbling. With your Dremel tool turning at a high speed, you're going to very carefully place the point of an X-Acto blade right into the turning plastic, just like this. Move off to the either side. Make sure your knife doesn't wobble or else you'll mess up the cut. After you've finished cutting, slow down the Dremel tool. Use a piece of 180 to 200 grit sandpaper, wet, and very, very lightly allow the turning plastic to sand the edges down. And this way you'll remove all the little plastic burrs. Once you're finished, you will almost always have one side of the tire that took no tread pattern. Use this side for the ground. The next step is to remove the wheel from the arbor. The 
The next step is to insert a rod or dowel, or in this case, a toothpick into the wheel, just like an axle. In order to complete your crosshatch tread pattern, you'll need a bastard file, which come in a number of sizes, or grits if you will. Select a bastard file with a tread pattern that comes close to the size that you're going to need to replicate on your tire. Mount it securely to your workpiece, and then put some lacquer thinner in the tread of your bastard file. Not too much. Put your tire down, and with force, walk your tire along. This will take a few passes. What's happening is the lacquer is softening the plastic and imprinting that crosshatch tread pattern in there. Be careful not to break your axle and try not to wobble. You want to get that tread pattern squarely on the tire, not up on the edges. It may take you a little while. It took me about 35, 40 seconds to get that pattern punched in there. But once done, you'll have a fairly accurate representation of a crosshatch tread pattern. Once the lacquer has dried and your plastic is no longer soft, you may need to come back with a little bit of sandpapering just to smooth out the rough edges. I wouldn't recommend a very heavy grit for this, maybe 180, 220 at the least. Back to our fairly well detailed kit wheels. If you did a good job assembling them, all that really needs to be done is to clean up the glued detail. Scrape that off. Use a little bit of wet sanding, semi-coarse sandpaper. You don't need to worry about being too fine. Keep in mind that wheels got a lot of wear and tear out in the uh, real world. And so if you scuff them up a little bit, no harm done. Not a real big problem. These are mosquito wheels. Now you'll notice that the mosquito wheel has transverse tread marks. And so the way to deal with that is to use a needle file and very neatly sand the tread back in. Not a problem at all. Very simple. Our B17 wheel presents slightly different challenge. It has a raised crossed hatch pattern. Again, all you really need to do with this is scrape away the excess glue, and then come back with a little bit of sandpaper. Try not to sand too much because you don't want to re remove all the detail. But as you can see, did a good job of gluing there, and the seam line just disappears. For our Japanese wheel, since it has a hole in the hub, then all we really need to do is let the Dremel tool do the work for us. A little bit of sandpaper. As you can see, the mold line virtually disappears. Once we paint it, you'll never see it. You'll also notice that the tread pattern has seemed to be worn away from the sanding. Well, this is fine too because in actual service, the tread pattern did get worn away. Our next sub-assembly that we'll work with are gear struts. When you're taking a look at your reference photographs, you'll notice that sometimes when the aircraft is heavily loaded, the gear struts are relatively compressed. However, when lightly loaded, you'll see that they're extended quite a bit. What we're going to do with this one is use our razor saw to cut the oleo so that we can reposition the whole strut and make it look like it's sitting under a heavy load. Very simple cut. Take care not to cut into the torque link behind the oleo. Make your strokes nice and easy and try to be as perfectly perpendicular to the oleo as you possibly can get. We'll clean up any discrepancies later on with an exacto blade. Carefully cut the elbow of the torque link so that the two pieces of the strut can be removed. Do your best not to damage that torque leak unless you want to build a new one. Match up the oleo that you just cut away with a piece of suitably sized aluminum tubing. Next, trim your struts 
so that they're nice and flat. Locate the center of the strut and with a suitably sized drill bit, use your pin vise to drill out the strut. About an eighth of an inch deep. Try to be as straight and true as possible. You say you need to replace the oleo with a piece of aluminum or brass in order to retain the structural integrity of the strut. And use a piece of bent wire to hold super glue. Hold a little drop of super glue and the super glue will hold your strut in place. And there you see the completed strut with the aluminum oleo. While we're at it with the Dremel tool, let's add a little bit of realism to our Messerschmitt 109 by adding some battle damage. You see, while we're building these little models, sometimes we have a tendency to forget the tremendous amount of damage that these and other aircraft suffered during the war. The aerial weapons of the day, such as 50 caliber machine guns and 20 millimeter cannon, didn't make the nice little rat-a-tat holes we see romanticized in the movies. Rather, the opposite was true. Huge gaping holes were torn into the aircraft surfaces when a group of shells hit their target. Bombers flying through flak bursts returned home looking like saves. Stray hits were common too, and uh, we'll attempt to depict this by using a rounded burr on a Dremel tool to shave away plastic so that it appears paper thin. You can see that as you shave your plastic down, the plastic becomes translucent. The trick here is to get to the point to where the plastic is virtually paper thin. Leave the area untouched for now, except to paint the inside aluminum. You'll need to mark this area also on the instruction sheet for future reference. Later, after assembly, we'll complete the battle damage. Let's stay on the subject of battle damage for a little while with a demonstration of a technique that I developed over 20 years ago. Now, I'll warn you right now that this particular technique is not for the weak at heart because it involves intentionally burning your completed and finished model. Often, aircraft suffered structural damage as a consequence of some unfortunate meeting with a solid, unyielding object. You know, like the ground. The result was a crumpled panel section or a bent wing or the like, which could be repaired with a similar part from an unflyable aircraft. So let's pick on our B-17 since it has a nice aluminum finish. But I will let you know that the technique does work well on painted surfaces. I'm using bare metal brand self-adhesive foil, which is available in a variety of finishes at your local hobby shop. I like to measure the areas I'm going to foil to save materials and keep from handling large pieces of foil. Transfer your measurements like this. Cut the section, peel the backing away, and, using a pair of tweezers, position the foil like so. I always try to work from the center out to the edges because it minimizes wrinkling of the foil, which becomes a really critical factor on compound curved surfaces. I also use a Teflon tipped burnisher available at a local art supply store to burnish the aluminum down to the plastic surface. However, a Q-tip will work equally well. Rotate the bare metal foil 90 degrees and use different finishes to break up the monotony of these large paneled surfaces. Second, and this is the hard part now, you need to heat the area with a butane lighter. Watch closely. I'm moving the butane lighter from over the top to the bottom, keeping the flame close to the aircraft. Now, as the plastic softens, you can bend the area, poke it with a rounded pole or anything suitable to achieve the desired effect. Inevitably, things happen that you hadn't planned for. You just have to be flexible and ready for them. I've got a burn through area here, not a problem. A little piece of aluminum foil will cover it up and no one will be the wiser. Any scorching can be removed with lacquer thinner on a Q-tip. Once completed, you can apply whatever clear protective finish you choose. Before we actually put paint to plastic, let's go over some painting basics that apply to any other form of modeling. The first involves that four-letter curse word of modeling, dust. 
For those of us without state-of-the-art clean rooms, there are some steps that can be taken in order to virtually eliminate the hazard. One is to paint in an enclosed room. Now I know this violates the sacred cow of painting in a well-ventilated area, but ventilation means that air is moving, carrying dust. You need a, an enclosed room so that you can evacuate the airborne dust. One way of doing that is to make sure that you stir up any dust that is in the room. But you should always keep your room clean nevertheless. So, in order to stir up the air in the room, we're going to turn on a fan. If you don't happen to have a ceiling fan like I do, you can use an oscillating fan or a floor fan. Anything will work just to get the dust stirred up in the room. At the same time I turn my ceiling fan on, I turn on my ventilator fan for about a half hour prior to painting. Once I begin to paint, I turn off the ceiling fan, but I leave my ventilator fan going. If you haven't the luxury of a ventilation fan, this high-tech air filter available from VA Environmental Marketing will do the trick. It not only removes all the dust in a small room, but it also eliminates paint fumes. I'll be using an airbrush to do most of the painting. However, if you don't have an airbrush, many of the colors that we'll be using are available in paint cans, the use of which I'll cover later. Paint cans are a little bit more expensive and require more masking than airbrushing, but the techniques are basically the same. Before a spray job, you want to ensure your airbrush is absolutely spotless. Even minute particles will clog the brush and make you crazy. I use a pipe cleaner soaked in lacquer thinner in order to clean petroleum-based paints. My favorite primer is Floquil Gray Primer. It's a lacquer-based paint that chemically bonds to the plastic. Modelers in the know will tell you that lacquer paint crazes plastic, but I'll show you how to lay down a barrier coat that will not harm plastic at all. For mixing my paint, I use graduated cups available at full service pharmacies for a very cheap price. Measure a known amount. Better too much than too little. Always use fresh paint to prevent clumping of the paint. The basic mix should start at approximately 60% pigment to 40% thinner. After spraying this mix, you may find your airbrush works better with a slightly different mixture ratio. A general rule of thumb, the thinner the mix, the more spatter you get. The thicker, or the more it clumps for an undesirable effect called orange peeling. With lacquer-based paints such as Floquil, use either Floquil thinner or a lacquer thinner available at your local hardware store. Once mixed and properly thinned, pour your mix into the airbrush paint cup. I use a piece of nylon hose to filter out any big particles that might be trying to sneak through. Prior to painting your part, wipe it with a tack rag. These are available at any hardware store and they are great for picking up excess dust. We're going to apply our dust coat here. Notice the angle of the airbrush relative to the part that's being painted. The angle here serves two purposes. Number one, it blows any remaining dust away. And number two, it applies a very fine coat of paint, which will act as a barrier coat for any further coats of lacquer paint. If your spray consistency begins to change as you are painting, add a drop of thinner to your paint cup. You will know this is happening if you have to adjust the volume control during spraying. You want this dust coat to be very, very light. Lacquer-based paints dry very quickly, so go back to your first part and start the process again. This time, increasing the volume of paint coming out of the airbrush by a small amount. For spray cans, you must be doubly cautious because they put out a fixed volume of paint regardless of your technique. Though you don't have to worry about the paint attacking the plastic, the paint will build up very rapidly and run if you don't hold your part far enough away from the nozzle. Check the manufacturer's instructions on the paint can to determine the nozzle to part distance. The next logical step is tackling those engines to make them come alive. 
Basic engine assembly and seam removal is similar to the rest of the model. Remember that your exhaust stacks in real life were either cast or welded items and therefore had seams. Nevertheless, you still want to tone the kit seams down a bit. Don't forget, drill out those exhaust stacks too. In order to liven up the engine, we're going to add just a little bit of detail that hasn't been molded in already. In order to add the detail, we'll just use a piece of kit sprue and turn it on our Dremel tool. Once I remove my turned part from the Dremel tool, I merely drill a little hole for a plastic mounting pin in the part, and I drill a corresponding hole in the side of the Merlin engine casing. Although I don't know what that part is in the picture, I added it because it looked like an interesting piece of detail. My next step is to drill some additional locating holes so that I can mount a little bit of extra tubing and wire just in order to dress the engine up and make it look more interesting. We'll go ahead and finish drilling some holes, but before we actually mount the wiring and plumbing detail, we'll paint the engine first. Merlin engines for Royal Air Force aircraft were usually gloss black with unpainted steel bolts. To break up the monotony of the overall black, I will dry brush with Floquil Old Silver and shade with dark brown pastels. Engine exhausts are painted dead flat black, oversprayed with a light dusting of rust, shaded with burnt sierra, and then burnt sienna for a realistic appearance. Then we can add lengths of wire for some extra detail. A Zero engine is a kit in itself and requires only a little extra attention to add some detail. We'll add that detail once the engine has been painted. paint and this is how it works. Load your brush up with just a little bit of black and then dip your loaded paintbrush into thinner, touch it to the cooling fin and capillary action will draw it into the recessed areas. And while we're at it let me remind you that you do not want to try to put lacquer paint over enamel paint. It'll eat the enamel paint. On the big radials, such as this Nakajima Sakai engine modeled by Hasegawa, you must turn your attention to the seam on the cylinder cooling fins. We are talking tedious here, but if you intend to display your engine, the seams on the cylinders will definitely detract from the overall appearance of the model. Remove your seams just like you would on any other part, but you can restore the cooling fin detail by running a razor saw right along the cooling fin. Clean it up with sandpaper after you're finished. The engine on the Japanese Zero will receive much the same treatment as on the B-17's engines, with the exception that the cylinder fins in the crankcase are black. In order to bring out the detail in these real black cylinders, I'm rubbing them down with Artists Aluminum Powder, which is available at any art store. We'll simulate the ignition wires with fine solder that's usually available at an electronic supply store.
Engines were hardly ever clean, so let's try a technique I learned from master car modeler Pat Covert. Mix black pastel powder in some glass cleaner like Windex and wash the completed engine. It may take a couple of washes, but again, be careful not to overdo it. And here's the completed engine, grime and all. thick. To get around this, you can vacuform a new part using the old as a master pattern. If you do not already own a vacuform machine, they are really quite simple to make. Mine is plexiglass with a car speaker grill as the platen. A hole in the box accepts an adapter from the vacuum cleaner. These two pieces of one quarter inch plywood are held together with wing nuts. The friction holds the plastic firmly in place. My total investment was about $1.50. The rest was scrap. In order to prepare your part for vacuum forming, you may need to sand out any excess rivet detail. Here, I'm drilling a hole next to this inlet so that the air suction will pull the plastic down over this protrusion. Finally, you want to mount your pit master on some clay or play-doh so that when you put it on the platen, the plastic will have sufficient distance to be pulled down over the part. Before you actually vacuum form, spray your master pattern with some mold release agent, which is available at, at your local auto parts store. Place your machine next to a heat source. In my case, I'm going to use my kitchen stove. Start melting your plastic. And once you notice it to start to droop, quickly place the plastic over the part and start the vacuum cleaner. The plastic will be sucked down over the mayo mold. Once completed, allow it to cool just for a few seconds. Remove the part from the mold, trim the edges, or just trim the edges using the part as a guide. Voila, there's your completed piece. You will have some scrap plastic left over from the vacuum forming process. Cut the plastic into 3 32nd inch wide strips to simulate reinforcing ribs. Using your references as a guide, glue the strips in place. Be sparing with the glue so that you don't melt the plastic. Once dried, use your references once more to drill the holes for the fasteners that were used on real aircraft to hold the cowling and other panels to the airframe. Voila! A realistically thin cowling. Now, set the part aside for painting later. The detail I've spoken of is really just a mere fraction of that which you're able to do. You can lower flaps. They only limited to the amount of time and effort you want to spend. The one final step before we actually assemble our model is to work on the cockpit. Everyone loves to check out the cockpit to see what goodies are inside. And in today's marketplace, you can easily spend more money dressing the cockpit than on the model itself. But the results can be such that you expect a miniature pilot could climb inside and fire that beauty up. I'll use the monogram BF109G as the basis of our cockpit detailing. Although released in the 70s by Ravel, this kit still holds up today as a classic of the mold maker's art. We'll use instrument panel parts, seat belt buckles, and rudder pedals supplied by Waldron Products. Waldron Products have been on the market since the mid-70s and stand out as some of the finest miniaturizations available, and at a reasonable price, too. We'll also use Cooper details for the cockpit tub and other aircraft parts. The latter, cast in rosin, are noted for their accuracy and quality. Once again, check your local hobby shop for these items. Clean your rosin parts in warm, soapy water. The etched metal parts require no cleaning. Check the detail kit assembly instructions to see what, if any, modifications are required to the basic model.
Trim the areas as necessary, retaping and refitting as many times as you need. Next, following the directions, tape the cockpit components together and dry fit in the fuselage. You will likely have to do additional trimming. You should not have to force the fuselage halves together. If you do, the seam could split sometime in the future. You will also need to dry fit the instrument panel. Now, many aftermarket detail kits are designed for a specific model made by a specific manufacturer. But some details, such as Edward and Airwaves, are generic and intended for any model. In all cases, you need to spend the time up front adding shims or shaving plastic as necessary. Stay away from trimming metal parts. You're asking for headaches if you do. Here's one technique for creating a custom instrument panel using Waldron's 132nd scale British aircraft instrument and bezel sets. First, transfer the outline of the kit part onto 10,000th white styrene card. Cut out your individual instruments. Transfer instrument locations to the new panel using the kit part or references. Fix each instrument in place with a bot of superglue. Overlay with a piece of oversized 5,000th clear acetate. Place the Waldron bezel on the tacky side of artist's frisket and cut each bezel out. Lightly coat the back of each bezel with a film of superglue and fix in place. Next, flow gloss black enamel on the instrument panel. The bezels will act as dams. Scribe around odd shaped instruments to create a dam to keep the paint out. Once dry, place a dot of thinned white glue into each instrument face. Once dry, spray with flat black. Remove the white glue with a pin. Dry brush the bezel faces with dark gray to bring them out. Trim the acetate and your instrument panel is ready for mounting. The cockpit of our BF-109 is painted in humbral dark gray, which is a color match for the official Luftwaffe color RLM-66. I am using a 3 aught poly -S red sable brush to ensure the best possible paint flow. The Revy gun sight gets a dot of old silver and is finished with clear lacquer. Trim chains are brushed with floquil gun metal. Wiring details get painted flat black. Although the Waldron foot pedals look fabulous, they need to be toned down a bit so that they don't stick out like a sore thumb. I'm using floquil gun metal here. To protect the color coat for subsequent handling, I prefer photographic finishes which are available at photo supply stores. They are costly, but they go a long way. Their advantage over anything else is that they dry quickly, are UV protectant, and will never crack, shrink, or yellow. You can spray them over any finish, acrylic, lacquer, bare metal, or enamel. They thin with lacquer thinner. We can now highlight the cockpit parts by dry brushing. We'll use Gunzi Sangyo's Dark Sea Gray. Load your brush lightly, paint a card till the paint barely comes out, and then you can begin dry brushing. Thinned black paint applied with 34 gauge brass wire adds color to the instrument faces. Pick out the white dials with white paint loaded onto a fine brush. Finally, add a drop of gloss varnish to simulate glass. The final step before assembly is to wash the parts with a dark color wash for added depth. But first, put on a coat of clear flat. If you don't have photo finish lacquer, Tester's Dull Coat will do. I'll cut some document protector to make the reflectors for the Revy gun sight. Super glue applied with a fine thin wire will hold our Revy gun sight reflectors in place. The fine rosin backing from these small parts is removed by lightly sanding on 400 grit sandpaper. Following the Cooper Details instructions, cockpit parts are assembled using super glue. Waldron seat belts are easy to install. Use slightly tacky tape, post-its are fine, to hold the parts so they won't go airborne. Cut thin strips of masking tape 
because it comes close in texture and color to the real items. The Cooper detail set with the Waldron details makes a veritable showpiece in itself. Before we begin final assembly, let's talk some more about colors. When you're building World War II aircraft, you have a huge field in which to exercise your individual creativity. The downside is that that field is full of mines. You see, part of the problem is that we won the war. How could winning the war be part of the problem? Well, after the war, Axis aircraft were piled into heaps and melted into pots and pans and cheap toys. Because at the time, no one was given much thought to posterity, only to getting home. Only a few were saved for technical evaluation in museums. This means you have some leeway in interpreting the colors on Axis aircraft. Now, there are some things that you must consider when building any World War II airplane. The first is the difference in paint batches. The second is the quality of the color and black and white emulsions of the time and the subsequent fading that's occurred over the years. Thirdly, official references were often contradictory. Fourth, from a field perspective, you have to understand that paint was used to control corrosion. And so any color that happened to be on hand was what got put on the aircraft. You have to also consider the effect that sun, weather, and combat damage had on paint. And then finally, sometimes the kit color references aren't always accurate. Royal Air Force World War II interiors were generally painted aircraft gray-green. I'll use a color-matched Humbrol paint to replicate the color for the Mosquito. The use of pastels is another technique for detailing interiors. You must be careful, though. The effect is very fragile, and you cannot apply a protective sealer. I like to use a contrasting color to highlight the basic paint job. Art supply stores carry pastels. Japanese interior colors are somewhat tricky to replicate. Some interiors were painted light green, while others were painted a metallic blue. I'll replicate the metallic blue by spraying a primer coat of Floquil Old Silver. Then I'll finish with Pactor Royal Blue, but I will mix only 30% blue pigment to 70% thinner. Also, and this is important, when you're normally spraying, you're usually around 30 to 35 pounds per square inch. But in order to do this technique, you need to be able to vary your pressure down to around 11 pounds per square inch. Our Monogram B-17 doesn't require as much work. Monogram and 132nd scale Revell products have so much detail molded in, you need only paint and highlight them, as I've described earlier, to achieve convincing results. Similar treatments should be given to wheel wells, engine cowlings, and other painted areas. Our basic interior color is zinc chromate, and this was the standard for U.S. Army Air Corps aircraft during World War II. You'll find wide variations in the actual color, ranging from a greenish color all the way to a yellowish color. Generally, instruments, boxes, and the like inside the aircraft were painted flat black. If you don't feel confident with your brushing skills, then mask off the surrounding areas like this. I use a scrap piece of plate glass to lay out my tape and cut it. And don't forget the small details like this navigator's clipboard. I finished it in Floquil Old Silver and Pactra Light Tan. I'll highlight the wiring bundles with a little bit of humble dark gray. Highlight the wiring bundle hold downs with a little bit of flat black. We'll dry brush the black instrument panels with some Pactra light gray. We don't use white here because it's a little bit too stark. While we're at it, just a little bit to the oxygen cord. While we're at it, just a little bit to the oxygen hose.
We'll now dry brush the aircraft ribs with some humbrol gray green, just in order to bring out the highlights in the ribs. Very light here. The color that I'm using is not etched in stone. It's not in, written in a book anywhere. I'm just using it to contra contrasting color to highlight the rib detail. This is an extremely subtle effect. And that's what you're looking for. Don't overdo this by any means or else it'll make your model look odd. If you're having a difficult time picking this up in the video, well, maybe that's not so bad. I do want this to be subtle. Our next step is to give the model a wash. Got some black with a little bit of Prussian blue just to take the edge off of it. Now, remember, this is going to look a little strange, first of all, but don't let that bother you. Give our instrument panel a little bit of a wash. In the final analysis, this helps to add depth to the, to the model. You can use a hair dryer on low setting to help the water dry. And what will be left behind is just the color. Once you've dried your water base paint, come back with a damp brush, the same one you used to put the paint on with in the first place, and brush back the areas, breaking up the large clumps of back black paint. The idea here is to have a nicely understated effect once more so that it shadows the ribs rather than paints them. And then too, aircraft often got dirty and so this helps to simulate some of the grime that accumulated in the aircraft. You can use a cloth wrapped around your finger to dab the excess watercolor away. The next step is to apply a coat of protective clear flat finish. I'm going to use a homemade punch here in order to remove the oxygen regulator control panel from the Waldron one quarter scale radio front panel sheet. I'll attach the oxygen regulator face with a dab of white glue. Use caution when attaching these parts. They are small and will fly away in a second. Here's the completed oxygen panel. And while we were at it, we added a little bit of detail to that navigator clipboard from the same Waldron sheet. In fact, if you want to, you can dress the complete cockpit with one of those Waldron sheets and add a tremendous amount of detail. Wheel hubs are generally aluminum in color. However, some aircraft painted their wheel hubs in squadron colors. Check your references just to make sure. We'll buff that wheel hub with aluminum powder. Brush away the excess with a soft rag. Now let's give it a coat of clear flat for subsequent handling. Now, add a black enamel wash to the recessed areas to bring out the depth. Now we'll wipe away the excess with a piece of paper dipped in enamel thinner. Tires are not a uniform black. Wear and tear dulls and muddies the natural finish. We will simulate this with a light overspray of testers rubber, followed by a dry brushing of dark gray. A little dusting of Grumbacher's flesh okra and burnt sienna pastels will complete the effect. Finally, give the tire a realistic bulge by pressing it lightly on a medium hot iron covered with aluminum foil. Remember, the side of the tire with the least tread detail goes down. Landing gears will get the same detail treatment as the engines and wheels. The B-17 struts will be covered with Floquil bright silver, buffed with aluminum powder, and then washed with black enamel. The Zero strut will wind up black, washed with gray. Both will be detailed with pastel powders. In order to make the oleo strut on the B-17 stand out, we'll add a little piece of bright bare metal foil. Finally, simulated nomenclature plates will be airbrushed using masks. Using the squadron signal in action B-17 as a reference, we'll add some detail to the hydraulic lines. We'll use fine solder 
bent to shape and held in place with super glue. Make sure that when you use your super glue that you use only small amounts. You don't want blobs on your painted surfaces. Paint the hydraulic lines flat black and leave the hydraulic coupling lines silver for a contrast. Most propellers are finished flat black with yellow tips and the hubs either gloss black or squadron colors. Although subject to wear and weathering, the effect cannot be overdone. I finished my B-17 props with dry transfer markings available from Woody Von Draycheck Enterprises. These transfers are masterful reproductions in full color. There are a number of techniques for replicating guns. The B-17's top turret gun was painted testers flat black, washed with humbral gray enamel, then lightly buffed with aluminum powder. The ammunition was dry brushed using testers brass. The B-17's nose turret gun was painted floquil old silver, given a misting of floquil gun metal, washed with testers gloss black, and then lightly buffed with aluminum powder for more of a cold steel appearance. Some engines must be installed for final assembly to take place. This is true for cockpits too. To keep out unwanted paint, make a protective cover for the engines by cutting cardstock and putting them in place. Make sure the fit is snug. Prior to adding paint to the surface of the aircraft, wheel wells and other areas should be taped off. Wet tissue tucked in small inlet holes is also an effective barrier to unwanted paint. With our interior complete, and our sub-assemblies mounted inside the aircraft, we can begin gluing the airplane together. I'll let the capillary action of the methyl ethyl ketone do my gluing for me, adding pieces of tape to hold the fuselage together. Careful not to get your fingers along the seam or else you'll glue imprints into the plastic. Whenever possible, I uh, glue from the back let the capillary action take the glue right down through the fuselage. If you happen to snap off one of the molded in antennas while you're gluing, don't let it bother you. You can always replace it later once you're finished. Because of the unique nature of the aluminum finish that we're applying to the B-17, don't glue the tail planes and the wings onto the fuselage. We'll do that later. Transparent parts are very brittle, so remove them from the sprue tree carefully. Careful not to get fingerprints on the parts, too. I like to use a chemical glue or a special super glue that emits no fumes. Anything else will craze the canopy. Here's a real simple and quick technique for getting the scratches out of canopies. I just buff them on my pants leg. Polyester works really well, too. We won't use the kit transparencies for these windows. I'll show you a technique later how to realistically simulate windows. We will disguise the seams by first applying putty, then sanding it smooth. Dimples can likewise be filled. Go easy with the putty and try to keep from smearing it on areas that don't need it. Be especially careful when applying putty around transparencies. I thin the putty with Tester's liquid plastic cement and paint the putty into the seams. Finally, check with your local hobby dealer for his brand of putty. When sanding the seams, work from heavy to fine grits. If you're wet sanding, don't let water get inside the model or it will fog the transparencies. I usually start sanding with a 220 grit and finish with a 400 grit. When you're finished, the putty should be glass smooth. A cautionary note here, you need to be very careful not to scratch any of the transparencies. For those of you who do not have rubber sanding pads, you can find these in Woodworker Supply, which is a catalog outfit. Drill out any holes so that you can replace antennas on the fuselage. Use a scribe and a flexible straight edge to replace obliterated panel lines. A knife is unsuitable because it merely spreads the plastic apart instead of removing it. If you do not have a scribe, a sewing needle chucked in the pin vise will work as well. Go slow and easy to prevent stray scratches. Aircraft use a variety of lights for illumination and recognition.
These round bulges represent formation lights, red, green, and amber. MV Products makes a range of colored lenses sold in railroad hobby shops. In lieu of these, you can make your own by turning clear plastic sprue in the Dremel tool and tinting the lenses with glass colorant, which can be purchased at a craft store. One bottle will last for years. Mask canopies using scotch tape. Stay away from masking tape, it's much too thick. Cut carefully with an X-Acto knife and then remove the excess with tweezers. Small openings like these are best filled with white glue thinned with water with a couple of drops of clear liquid detergent. Prior to applying any finish on your model, give it a wipe with a little bit of enamel thinner just to remove surface oils from your hands. Then, just prior to painting, wipe it down with a tack rag. I learned this technique from fellow IPMS modeler Les Sunt. After about three hours, the varnish will be tacky to the touch, enough to capture a fingerprint, not enough to come away on your finger. The next step is to liberally rub aluminum powder onto the varnish. No buffing, just coat the varnish with powder, then set it aside till tomorrow. After the varnish dries completely, about 24 hours, use more aluminum dust to buff the panels out to a solid metallic sheen. And by the way, aluminum dust is highly flammable, so no open flames. After you've finished buffing the finish out to get the desired sheen, coat it one more time with varnish and let it dry for another 24 hours. This will protect it against further handling. Different panel effects can be achieved by laying down different types of aluminum foil. Additionally, you can paint clear decal film with other types of paint like Flocal Old Silver and put that down also to achieve a varied number of effects. I've used Artist's Prepared Frisket to mask off the area for the pilot's anti-glare panel. Frisket is a low-tack adhesive mask that will not pull up the underlying paint. Its only drawback is its limited ability to adhere to curves. I'll shade the OD with flesh ochre to simulate weathering from the sun. Assemble the wing using tube glue and MEK. Once dry, apply a bead of white glue to hide the seam. When the white glue begins to set, ferret into the seam with your finger. Let it set for several hours, then apply metal foil to the seam. In order to fill in our windows, let's go ahead and cut away the aluminum and the liquid mask that we applied earlier. The same white glue mixture we used to mask off that hole, we will now use to make a window. Try to make it as thin as you possibly can. Let the window dry face down, and when it's completely dry, you'll have a crystal clear window. Now you remember at the beginning of the video when we talked about how to do some battle damage? Here's what it looks like. But this guy took a major hit. A little bit of dry brushing with silver highlighted the damage to the paint job. If you wanted to go a little bit further, you could add some damaged ribs to the inside of the fuselage. Painting Luftwaffe aircraft requires a certain degree of research. Color schemes varied widely from one model to another, so to stay on solid ground, we'll use the paint schemes and decals from the Ministry of Small Aircraft Production Quarter Scale G10 Sheet. This Canadian company has, in a very short time, established itself as a leader in the aftermarket decal industry. I hope you've enjoyed the modeling tips on World War II aircraft. It's been my pleasure to be your host. My name's Chuck Davenport, and we'll see you again on Video Workbench.